Synthetic pesticides are poisonous to the environment, but our industrial food systems are dependent on the use of these toxic chemicals. We design plants and crop systems so that they can compete with nature at the expense of nature. The good news is, as a result, we have something to eat. Pesticide producing companies make billions in sales and lobby to keep industrial food systems in place. It's an absolute scandal. But some companies say they are working to make products that are more sustainable. So how damaging are synthetic pesticides? And to what extent do we really need them to survive? Answers coming up in this episode of Transforming Business. Picking the pack choy one at a time. It's backbreaking work, and especially when there's evidence of unwelcome visitors. You can see it here, it's brownish. These are the feeding tunnels of very small cabbage flies. Their caterpillars then eat through here. It doesn't look nice. These pests and others are a problem for all farmers, but particularly here at Kohler, an organic vegetable cooperative based near Leipzig in Germany. While insects can attack the plants, causing damage and even making the vegetables unsellable, Left to grow, weeds choke off space and sunlight, giving crops less chance to thrive. Without fungicides and products like that, it would be very difficult to grow food. We would need a lot more people in agriculture to do this by hand, if we wanted to do completely without it. At this farm, workers don't use synthetic chemical pesticides. Instead, they rely on biological and manual alternatives, like plowing or introducing natural predators. It's more work, but farmer Jacob Gruner thinks there has to be an end to industrial agriculture. You can see the impact of this form of economic activity that we've been practicing since the 1940s in the extinction of species worldwide. It can't keep on like this. It's a growing perspective here in Germany. People are becoming ever more skeptical of synthetic pesticides. Organic farming has grown from covering 2.9% of land in 1999 to just under 10% in 2022. But conventional agriculture, which uses synthetically produced chemicals to control pests, including weeds, insects and fungi, is still overwhelmingly shaping our landscape. So how did we get here? Humans have been ridding their crops of pests for at least the last two and a half millennia. But the early 20th century, as agriculture industrialized, brought the birth of human-made pesticides. The population grew to an extent that couldn't be fed anymore by the, uh, the ways agriculture worked at that moment. There was a very high um, attempt to try to find ways to produce chemicals that could kill insects or weed at an industrial scale too. Elena Kunand is a PhD student studying the history of pesticides. There was a very big production of the chemicals in the Second World War. This um, use of the chemicals throughout the 1940s showed their success and that was then used by the chemical industry to pretty much commercialize it and show everybody else um, yeah, the, the miracle of synthetic pesticides. Pesticides like DDT, which was used by Allied soldiers to ward off mosquitoes and lice for themselves and the communities they liberated and later used to kill insects in homes in the US and also in agriculture. The argument for using those substances was clearly the lack of agricultural workers and the need to produce a lot of food in a very short time. So um, this is mainly due to a, uh, like an um, exploding population throughout the world. The crop protection industry has continued to grow to an estimated value of around $78.7 billion in 2022, according to market intelligence agency S&P Global. The top consumers of pesticides worldwide are Brazil, firmly in the lead, followed in distant second by the USA, and then Indonesia, Argentina and China. But farmers in those countries face a growing problem. When you use one herbicide, in large amounts, the likelihood that you find resistance against that is increasing. That's Bayer's Head of Sustainability, Matthias Berninger, 
and he should know. Bayer's leading pesticide Roundup contains glyphosate, one of the most widely used herbicides in the world. Tolerances are building up over time against all of the uh, herbicides in use. Meet Palmer amaranth, a weed causing havoc in corn and soybean fields across the US, and resistant to multiple herbicides, including glyphosate. At Bayer's Crop Science Research Laboratories in Frankfurt, the company is developing a new pesticide to combat this weed and other unwanted plants that have become resistant to current herbicides. They spray weeds with test compounds using cameras to collect data on their impacts. The result is a new weed killer, Ecaphalin, that targets unwanted plants that have already emerged from the ground. Technology is essential. Bioscientists say using artificial intelligence and a new approach they call crop key, they have been able to narrow down molecules that specifically target the weeds and that are safer for users and the environment. It is able to, for example, slow down their growth or kill the plant altogether. Why is that important? Every spring when the farmer kind of comes out and uh, uh, kind of puts new seeds in the ground, those seeds compete with the existing plants, with weeds. The new herbicide is undergoing a long-term study to discover any risks as part of the eventual registration process. But Berninger says Bayer can't rule out all negative impacts associated with pesticides. Well, it will have negative impacts, for example, on biodiversity because it is designed to destroy plants for example, some insects are, are feeding off. Yeah? Plowing has the same negative impact. So a lot of what is being said about glyphosate and the negative impact on biodiversity is true, but it's equally true for plowing. But it's this expense to nature that's one of the major drawbacks to synthetic pesticides, say critics. But what are those impacts? One of the most commonly known is the impact on bees and other insects, vital in pollinating some of our crops. Around one in 10 bee and butterfly species is threatened with extinction in Europe, according to EU figures, with pesticides among the causes. Pesticides also degrade into soil, harming organisms that keep Earth healthy, like earthworms, ants, and beetles. They can stay there for years and impact the soil's ability to absorb carbon dioxide. Then there's water. Pesticides can run off fields and into water sources, even making it into the ocean, poisoning fish and wildlife. But it's not only pesticides that are causing the damage. Experts say industrial agriculture in general is taking a huge toll. You reduce biodiversity, you basically produce a dead land. Guy Pierre is a conservation biologist at IDIV, the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research and the UFZ Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. So the current mode of production is extremely efficient. We're producing a lot, much more than we need in fact, um, but we're losing everything with it. We're losing the farmers, we're losing nature, we're losing soil and we're poisoning um, the consumers uh, and the water. And that means that we really have to find solutions to this intensive mode of production without losing the capacity to produce enough food for a growing population. In 2022, the European Commission adopted a proposal for a new regulation with EU-wide targets to reduce by 50% the use and risk of chemical pesticides by 2030. It was part of plans to reduce the environmental footprint of the EU's food system and help mitigate the economic losses. But the sustainable use regulation, as it was called, was scrapped after being watered down, with observers blaming lobbying from pesticide producers. The final proposal became so weak that many political groups on the left and progressive, they thought this is worse than the law that we have. So we cannot let this pass. Nina Holland is a researcher and campaigner at NGO Corporate Europe Observatory, which tracks business lobbying in Europe. They were conveniently and, and ironically helped by external circumstances like the COVID crisis and the, the war by Russia on Ukraine. That basically fueled a new rhetoric of saying we can't, absolutely, we can't reduce the use of these substances right now because of food security. Globally, Swiss firm Syngenta is the biggest player in the pesticide market, followed by German companies Bayer and BASF, US-based Corteva and Indian firm UPL. 
Between 2020 and 2022, the company spent 40.4 million euros, along with crop protection and agricultural lobbying groups, lobbying against EU policies, including the proposal, and another 15 million in 2023. Basically, what they were fighting for was their own profits, because with a 50% reduction target, their profits would have gone down massively as well. Another major setback for campaigners was the reapproval of controversial herbicide glyphosate within the EU. The pesticide is the main ingredient in Roundup, a weed killer that Bayer took over when it bought US agrochemical company Monsanto in 2018. The World Health Organization has categorized glyphosate as probably carcinogenic to humans, although Bayer maintains it's safe, and the EU's European Food Safety Authority said it found no critical areas of concern. The European Union has the most strict way of approving pesticides in the world. Brussels is the Silicon Valley of regulation. If something is even safe enough to be approved by Brussels, we can assume it's safe. But not everyone is convinced. We as an organization work in the defense of human rights. And in that field of human rights, we work for the right to food, the right to land, the right to health, and the right to the environment. Maria Jose Venancio is a human rights lawyer at the Center for Legal and Social Studies of Argentina. Along with several other NGOs, the center has filed a complaint with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, against buyers' business practices in South America. It's based on a model of maximum profitability. What they're trying to do is to sow the largest area of land that's possible without farmers, but directly through machines, using genetically modified seeds with a package of poisons that includes glyphosate, so that the land can endure more and more. But it is land that keeps degrading, so that no other things can be planted there. According to the organizations, largely based in South America, on average more than 50% of the agricultural land in Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay and Bolivia is cultivated with soybeans, many genetically modified to withstand the effects of glyphosate used to kill the surrounding weeds. They argue that as a result, people in the region suffer from poisoning and serious diseases, that water sources can no longer be used, and that thousands of hectares of forest are being cut down to make way for soybean plantations, threatening local animals and plants. These are the direct consequences of the agricultural model promoted by the multinationals. Some European-based agrochemical companies also continue to sell pesticides banned in the EU in South America and beyond. Pesticides containing paraquat, a weed killer manufactured by Syngenta and linked to Parkinson's disease that has been banned in the EU since 2007, for example, and atrazine, the second most widely used herbicide in the US. It cannot be that the EU holds to such double standards that it allows corporations to produce inside the EU products it has long banned in order to export it around the world to countries like uh, from Ukraine to Vietnam to South Africa to Brazil and do incredible harm to people, communities and uh, to the environment at large. With so many health and environmental drawbacks associated with synthetic pesticides, the question is, do we need them? Humans have relied on agrochemicals since after the Second World War for industrial farming. Production has rocketed in the decades that followed, but it's devastating populations of bees and other pollinators, destroyed soil and contaminated water. A new generation of pesticides like those being developed by Bayer could offer some solution, but only if it comes with a change in the way and quantity the pesticides are used, which Berninger says the company plans to promote. So we are absolutely in favor of reducing. We also invest in digital agriculture, which will change the way crop protection is applied. Drones would apply it on the spot early on and not in a broad scale across all the fields. Still, some experts say it doesn't go far enough and that an entire overhaul of the farming system is needed to take away the reliance on chemicals. The current model of production is actually forcing us to use pesticides. You can't do without. So farmers are becoming more and more dependent on pesticides because the larger the field is, the more sensitive it is to the attacks. If you have 
large amount of corn, then you'll be attacked by whatever is atta attacking corn. The same goes for potatoes, etc. So you cannot really avoid pesticides without a more complicated solution. At the Organic Cooperative in Leipzig, workers are packing boxes to send out to the 1,400 subscribers to the scheme. At 35 hectares, the land is relatively small when compared with some conventional farms, but there are plans for the cooperative and its sustainable model to more than double its size. We have an extinction of species that was unprecedented before humans existed. And I believe that this ecosystem will continue to break down and decay and that life will become difficult for us sooner or later if we don't try to move in the right direction. I think we can achieve an incredible amount through agriculture, because agriculture uses and requires so much land worldwide. And I believe it would actually make a huge difference when it comes to biodiversity and climate change. What do you think? Should we be relying on synthetic pesticides to grow our crops or looking for alternatives? Let us know in the comments below.